Welcome you all once again to session number five. We are going to talk about rare diseases, Latin America, and the UN resolution on addressing the challenges of persons living with a rare disease and their family. We are excited and honored to be joined by our moderator, Diego Fernando Gil Cardoso, Executive Director of Colombia Federation of Rare Diseases, Tagore, Clara Herba's former public affairs lead of Rare Diseases International, Fabio Gonzalez, President of the Italian Foundation of Skin Diseases, and Felipe Tapia, Director of Maxilla in Chile. You can find our full biographies on our first YAPO Congress website, and remember to use the Q&A, Q&A, leave your questions to the speakers, and I turn the floor over to you, Diego. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Yapo. We are members. We have been members for a long time now. And thank you so much for giving, giving us this space to talk about such important things. And we couldn't leave this topic behind. This is so important to all the community in Latin America. We have been educating people in this topic and we had a great advances. So in this session, we are going to talk about the resolution for rare diseases in Latin America and how we can address the different challenges that people with rare diseases have. In order to make an introduction and share some context with you, we am we are going to discuss the importance of the resolution. But that's not it. We are going to talk about regard to Soto law for the families and the patients. It was established in Chile, and we are going to talk about the differences between the resolution and the law, and see if it's better to have a global resolution or to have regional laws to stand by the patient's rights. One of our speakers is going to explain how the resolution was adopted last year. And this is something unique around the world because basically around the world, we can have many people with a diagnosis of a rare disease and seeing that through the resolution, we we try to have a great advocacy of their rights and reduce the different challenges that we have. As for regard to Soto Law, we had many foundings in Latin America, especially in Chile, to treat people with rare diseases. And we're going to have two speakers talking about the law, how the impact was in everything that's related to health and patient's treatment. And now, I'll turn the floor over to Clara Erbas. She's going to be the first speaker. And Clara, first of all, to start talking about this context of something that's unique, as I said before, we would like to know what the resolution is, how it is, and why it's so important. Thank you so much, Diego. I have the presentation, as you can see. And yes, the idea was to talk about the resolution and also talk about the process, how we came here. So next slide, please. I want to address these two questions. So first of all, what the UN resolution is and why it's necessary to have it Next slide, please. So, first of all, I want to explain what a resolution of the UN is. I think that not everyone knows about it, and we had to learn this. I think that this represents the voice of the 193 members, country members of the UN. So here we can see the agreement that we had 
the different ideas and the global cooperation. This is a right for the different member states and we also gather together many many topics this is important for the UN for the different programs that we have and this is not binding with the health organization for example but it has an impact because it's a kind of coordinator of the UN. Next slide, please. So on the resolution about the challenges of people with rare diseases and their families, it was adopted on the General Assembly on last December. And before that, we had different agreements on the third commission of social, humanitarian, and cultural matters. It has two parts. In the first of all, we have all the introduction with all the pieces of information, and it starts with different verbs as recognizing, highlighting. So in this case, they are talking about rare diseases. And in the second part, we have the resolution points. Here we have the UN opinion and the actions to be taken. And here we are talking in present tense. So we request, next slide, please. Civil society and DRGI, the campaign and many members, they gather together to stand by five things. You can see them on the screen. So they were talking about inclusion of people with rare diseases and their families, a respect of their rights. The second topic is related to improving health and caregiving promoting actions nationally so that no one's left behind then the inclusion and recognition of the UN system and then monitoring through different reports how the process is going on implementation. We always had the contribution of civil society. So in the next slides, I'll talk about what was included on this text. So, many items were included. So, the first request was about human rights. And we have different paragraphs that are requesting to gather together data so that we can identify patterns of discrimination and also address the different discrimination causes. Then, we want to improve education and learning rights to everyone. They wanted to promote the right to work and have a decent work and going back to work. We know that this may be complicated with pe to people with rare diseases. They want to provide infrastructures that are accessible and a good quality, have an, an equal workflow during in the different households. We know that women usually do this. Next slide, please. The second request was about appropriate care given. So we had many paragraphs asking to improve equality in health to have a stronger health system approaching the different needs, both physically and mental, this was really important. So they were requesting to cover from now to 2030 all the things that are needed so that there is a better diagnosis, technology, quality. And it requests to invest 
in all the different costs that many times the patient itself has to pay. Something that's really important for us is that it's asking to create a network between different experts and different entities and have collaboration and also improve research. Next slide, please. Another thing that was included on the resolution and was something core for us was to ask the member states of the UN to adopt strategies, action plans, and different, different rules and legal steps, taking into account gender and improving the well being of the different patients. They need to recognize that people with rare disease, they need to have the access, the equal access to education, work, and health. Next slide, please. Another important thing is that the rare diseases should be recognized on the UN system. So far, it was a topic which was not discussed that much. But with this resolution, they are trying to include people with rare diseases in different activities and that they are part of the agenda for 2030. Next slide. And now to wrap up, something really important for us was to include a process to monitor how the resolution was being implemented and what, what the progress was. So in this resolution, they requested to include rare diseases in one of the sessions of the UN to 2023 and to create a report that is going to be presented next year. So we wanted to include a regular report within the text requesting the UN to have a report every three or five years to keep tracking the process, but for now we couldn't do so. So we'll see if we can do it in 2023. So next slide, please. Something that we want to highlight is that we are in touch with RTBI and we need to ask ourselves how to make this resolution have an impact on national policies because it's not a law itself so it's not binding with the member states but we know that through the resolution we can spread a message and then there are different members can use this in their countries and this was really important for us because this way we give visibility to this community of rare diseases and as i said before we are spreading this idea of having strategies and national roadmaps and then something really important is to include rare diseases as part of the implementation of the, as the national implementation on universal health coverage so this is a plan, this is in the agenda for 2030. So now RTI is working on this. They have different pieces of information on their website and people with rare disease can access the material and move forward. Next slide, please. So now, if we talk about the international perspective, what we are going to do and what the resolution is, is six collaboration between regions. This is included in one of the paragraphs. And it can be something that inspires authorities so that they include rare diseases on the reports that they need to do about the Agenda 2030 progress. So there are volunteer reports, but they need to do it in the UN every some years. So 
Now I want to wrap up saying that this can have an impact on the UN and another international forums. So I wanted to ask you to, to answer you, Diego. This is about how we are dealing with the campaign and I don't want to run out of time. Thank you very much, Clara. It was very important what you just said. I believe it would also be interesting to get to know the context or the history you prepared. I believe that we could have time. So we should get to know how this process and this resolution process was. I would appreciate if you can share something with us. Great, so I will continue with some more slides, if possible. I believe I'm having some connection issues, or I don't know what's going on, but I have some delay. Okay, no problem. I can work without slides. It would be more natural. So, something that was important, evidently, was to understand UN system and its priorities in order to adapt our message. So, here we are. Let's move to the next slide, please. Thank you. As I already explained, this is not only a work from RDI, Rare Disease International, it's also a work of EURODIS, which is the European Organization for Rare Diseases. It's one of the alliances with more rare disease patients in the world, and they have a special advocacy state at the social and economic committee of the united nations and we believe it would be important to be a part of this process in united nations it's a very long process with a lot of forums that could take three years but was essential we created a platform that was the ngo committee for rare diseases it was a legitimate platform within an entity that is very well known in the United Nations world and the different servants from UN system acknowledge this platform and are willing to listen more from those organizations and the members of those different alliances. This was something key. As I was saying before, the most important thing was to understand which were UN priorities. It's a very complex organization divided in different agencies with different headquarters, Geneva, New York. So we needed to study this to try and understand with whom we should talk and about what. Very quickly, we got to know that New York was the place to talk about social development. That was our focus to start talking about rare diseases. Of course, those people are not only in lack of health coverage, but they're also facing other challenges related to education or work. It was very important to link this issue to the Sustainable Agenda 2030. We also need to understand permanent missions of United Nations that are sort of ambassadors, embassies uh, in representation to different countries. They have different servants that change from different international affairs or foreign affairs ministers from different countries. So they have a rotation. That's why the different members at the national level were very important. They were working in this linkage with the different national authorities, they held meetings in the capital cities and spread our world. 
Another important thing that we needed to understand, as I already explained, were UN resolutions, the style, the language. So we work in a private mapping of every resolution that had something to do with rare diseases or could be linked somehow, something that we could reproduce. It was very important as well. Let's move to the next slide, please. One more. I'm not sure if it's working correctly, but yes, this is the one I think. That's what I'm I was talking about. One of the most important things was to make sure that we have uh, a group of member states that supported this resolution, this initiative. They write the main draft or the, the primary draft and they present this to the General Assembly of the United Nations. They will then be in charge of negotiations on this draft and they will open this to other member states of UN so they can sponsor this draft. Later, they will present this under the adequate article on the agenda of the Third Commission of the General Assembly at United Nations. One of the most important topics that we needed to tackle was to find those allies in this campaign, the countries that could provide support. We had the support of Spain, Brazil, and Qatar. Those were the countries that were part of this specific group. And Spain will work with the National Federation of Rare Diseases, and it was essential. They kept relations with the Health Ministry and Foreign Affairs Ministry in Madrid, and they had a very good relationship with the royalty of Spain. So all those elements contributed a lot in this path. Next slide, please. The most important thing was to try and promote the maximum support as possible with different approaches. We had to gather with different countries. We had more or less 60 meetings and we had this top-down approach and the grassroots approach in order to organize the different resolution campaigns and the different sessions. Let's move to the next few slides. It was very important to demonstrate that we were present at the United Nations system. So we organized different sessions, different events. We had meetings with the permanent missions. The ones that I mentioned were sort of em embassies. We tried to generate contact with different allies, with hierarchy, and the WHO, for example, or any other authorities that had links with the rare diseases organizations or associations. And we also worked a lot in trying to include rare diseases as word of group of words in the text of United Nations the most we could. So we created this campaign with different tools for our members, with templates of letters that they could send to the different political authorities in their countries with explanation and images for social media. And there was also a campaign that it was called Dear UN, and people with rare diseases replied to specific questions that they would like to be asked by politicians at the United Nations levels. This was very important because that way they were able to understand personal experiences and they were able to also to um, generate empathy and respond to them. I'm sorry, it was very quickly. I just wanted to throw out, go throughout the slides very quickly to let you know how we work on this. Don't worry. If you agree, we can continue with the other panelists, and if we have time, at the end, we can use some time of the Q&A part to add any other comments that you didn't. 
undoubtedly, everything you mentioned it was very important because until reaching a specific resolution as you described, you had to learn a lot. It's a very uh, important learning curve and you had to engage with different countries that needed to support the initiative as the sponsors of the resolution. So I believe you had to include a lot of efforts in there. Now, please, let's talk about how we can develop different initiatives at the local level so we can have this contrast between global, local, and national. So now I'd like to invite Fabio Gonzalez, president of the Chilean Foundation of Skin Diseases. Welcome, Fabio. Please let us know about the law Ricardo Soto that was created in Chile in 2015 why it was created and what are the challenges. Hello, Diego. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me explain you how this started. Next slide, please. We started at that time working as the uh, psoriasis Chilean Corporation with a huge number of patients, and we were working independently. Next slide. We were working independently. This was in 2007. Our idea was to deliver assistance to more of uh, more than 500 patients that we had with this pathology. Sadly, we realized we didn't have support from the government and we didn't have also specific attention for uh, psoriasis patients. Next slide. You know how life goes. And we got to know a journalist that suffer a specific disease, lung cancer. He started to look for help from support from the government. Specifically, the request was for devices, medical devices, medicine, to people that suffer different types of diseases. At that time, together with the firm patients' organizations, we organized a demonstration for sick people. Next slide. This demonstration was organized at a national level. We managed to gather many, many people from public sectors. Next. And we did this very first demonstration in 2013. We had approximately 10,000 people. Many of them were sick people or relatives of those patients. They have different types of pathologies and they were requesting the support from the government. Next slide. Later, we organized another demonstration in 2014. And what we wanted was to pressure the government so we can have more support. Having support from government during this sick people demonstration allowed that the different patients associations Unify efforts. One of the most important problems that many countries in Latin America face is the struggle.
Manish, is it there? Okay, good. Next slide, please. The funds that we were trying to get were like this. In 2014, government should contribute with 100 million trillion pesos, but it's something about $163,000. Later, in 2015, the government should contribute with 30,000 million trillion pesos, which is the equivalent to 48 thousand dollars later in 2016 and 2017 the figures you can see in the slides at the beginning we thought those figures were interesting but considering the number of patients we had it wasn't enough Our idea was to have a support, a fund to support acquisition of medicine, drugs, medical devices, and therapists. But at the end, it didn't work like this. Commonly, government turned things around so that it could be easier for them. At the end of the day, patients will continue suffering the consequences but were able to receive those amounts of money and we could start to treat different pathologists that had specific needs of therapies that had a high cost. Next slide. This was based specifically on some Bills, the bills are published by different patients, organizations, or alliances, or even physicians, and they can present their cases so they can be included in those documents and those bills that will later turn into Ricardo Soto Law. The people that took part in this process and this sort of tender could enjoy the benefits of the therapies in the next year. Next slide, please. This allow us to work with more patients. Commonly what happened in our country was that most part of therapies for our patients were clinical trials. The help from government wasn't there. We started to work with the network organized by the health ministry in order to gather and deliver medicines that we needed to treat different pathologists. Next slide, please. Next. Let's talk about coverage. Coverage consider therapists with high cost. Those treatment could have an impact on the families because they couldn't afford it. That way, we were able to include medicine, food, and medical devices or resources. This law apply for every patient. We didn't have any type of differences. Every trillion people could benefit from this law. Next. There is something important about this law. Different pathologists have started to be included gradually. 
we started with three or seven and we estimate that in 100 years from now we could include every pathology in this law next we have some critical points that we should consider in Chile and in other countries in America, we don't have a record of the cysts. We don't have a specific diagnosis because we don't have many specialists or experts. And in many cases, treatment for rare diseases are palliative treatments. We don't have solutions because those diseases don't have cure. Also, as Squad already mentioned, as an organization trading psoriasis at a global level, we presented to United Nations a request in order to be included by WHO in a specific document as a disease that is non-communicable, it's chronic disease, it's painful and will inhabilitate the patient because there is no cure. This work that was held during two years globally. As Clara mentioned already, with the support of the ambassador from the United Nations in representation in Panama, Mexico, Colombia, and many other countries, they had to move forward with this request. And that way, we were able to publish in the 67th World Health Assembly, a resolution about global psoriasis. It was magnificent. We were able to reach amazing achievements. Nevertheless, there were still some worries. This resolution, it's only a global recommendation. And every recommendation, every resolution that is granted by United Nations are recommendations. So they're not binding, they're voluntary. Unfortunately, the fact that specific country will receive this resolution won't mean that they will be working for the sick people. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are running out of time. I'm so sorry. Now let's move forward to the next presentation. We should go with Felipe because we don't have many time in order to answer some questions at the end. So if you agree, we can wrap up here. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. And we can understand that it was a huge effort from civil society in Chile. So now I would like to invite Professor Felipe Tapia, Director of MaxiLife from Chile, to share with us which were the contributions that patient organizations made to this law. How was this process and how was it from the perspective of patients and families? The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to be as quick as possible. As you can see here in the slide, we can, we can see Fabio and other collaborators. We built this structure. Next slide, please. I believe that the most important thing of our work is that as organization, we managed to contact the best physicians in Chile that treated the pathologists we were working with. And that way, we had scientific information the needed and the best one to treat our patients. This is our secret as patient organization. Next slide. Besides, 
we organize the for meetings with their patient we know their needs we know how is their reality next thanks to that we can create clear information and generate the necessary structure to request what the patients need next slide one of the common problems is to figure out what we need and where we are. Next. The answer that the government provides us is the resources they have to offer us. So when we manage to structure real needs, we can start building a direct relationship with Ricardo Soto Law, with the medicine organizations and with the whole necessary structure in order to provide a good quality attention for our patients. So how is the development of this process? Each one of the institutions I'm mentioning here is an institution that allow us to create the structure to help our patients in their relationship with the government. Ricardo said a law provided two important elements of citizenship participation, medicine or drugs administration, and also, most importantly, surveillance and monitoring of this law that is also organized by patients organizations and civil society. Next slide. So we're not talking only about world structure or having a network with the world or, or our patients, but due to this law, we are able to request to everyone involved in our patient's health how the financing is working, the amount of money we are receiving, and if this attention is recurrent, as Fabio already mentioned, we will it will take us one more hundred years and we want to be able to include every pathology. Next slide, please. So in every country, they tell us how much we should fund and we tell them, give us a number now. This is part of a law. So now this is something mandatory. It's not as the UN, as they mentioned before. It is a law. So we need to be informed. So when a patient tell us that they are suffering is because they are. So with this law, we know that every organization involved in this law, they need to help them with this pain. Next slide, please. So as a patient, it can, took us, it, it can take us months to recover from a pathology. Here we can see it on the graph. So for example, in this case, we have all the records. Next slide, please. So we are demanding, this is mandatory. We are not requesting. We can have clear results. We can be efficient and we can know how the health system is developing. Next slide, please. So the problem is that the law it's perfect, it helps all the patients, but it doesn't have any money, as I said before. So, next slide, please. So we know that this can end because we don't have money. The law is fantastic, but we don't have money. So we need to work together and we need to see what we can do. We're going to publish a report in some weeks and we have many requests to help the law, including fundraising so that we can have more money. Next slide, please. So when we see how the investment in going, is going in Latin America, the world, you can see that the traditional stands for 100%. This yellow line that you see here is about investments that can be made through the law. Uh, this is a short scale. You can see that there's a part saying that it accepts donors. Can you see the line? It's almost impossible because in a country, the idea is huge, it's beautiful, but we can't take it to practice. Next slide, please. So what we do? 
what we're doing in the country is we want to know where the things are breaking, what the problem is, and we provide solutions to the government. And now we are part of this table giving suggestions to the government so that they know the change that they need to make. And this is really transparent. So in all the conversations that we have, we open the floor. They are available on the health seats of the health ministry in Chile. And you can know about everything that was discussed. So if we were there, we were there before. But then they told us that we don't have any more money and now we need to seek a solution. So this is the difference between requesting some information because we need so or having a law. Now this is mandatory. So it's a huge change and I would like all of you to know more about this law. I'm about to finish. First of all, we need someone to help us. We need to talk to patients so that we know about their true realities. Sometimes governments don't have these pieces of information. Third piece of advice, make participation possible. So not everything should be political. We shouldn't have health organizations with doctors and just that. Because we patients, we dream as well. So let us dream. We need what we know what we need. We don't have a limit. We have a need. And lastly, when you are in the law, respect the law and take care of that law because it's so difficult to have a law published. This is the first time in which we have a law in two steps. First of all, what the medicine is going to be and then how the law works. Thank you so much. Thank you, Felipe, for all your thoughts. And we, now we have a view of the global situation. We have three experts. We have Fabio, Clara, Felipe. So now we're going to have this space to share some thoughts and some questions that we have as well. So Benito Diaz from Venezuela, he is asking something that you mentioned, but this is for Clara. How do you think that, because he says that this is related to rare disease, and she, she wants you to explain more about the resolution, Clara. Well, as, as you know, it's not a law, it's not binding. And the member states, they are not obliged to apply this. But they have this pressure of a global organization. So they agreed, even though this is not through a law, they agreed on that, so they are going to deliver everything that they signed and that they included on the resolution. So now different patients, organizations, national organizations of rare diseases, of a specific disease, what they need to do is to use the resolution to remind people in power that they told us they were going to do so. So now is the time to know how they're going to do it. So as they explained, with regard to Soto Law, we have a great example. Great, Clara. Thank you so much. Now they're also asking us, let me read it. This is for Filippi, and maybe Fabio, you can add some comments. So the question is that in 2015, when regard to such a law was passed, we did not have the gene and cell therapies that we have now. We think that the precision medicine should be our right. Will this require changing the advocacy tactics and requests? 
I think that the problem is costs. This is always like this. So when our budget is limited, then the impact is going to be that we'll have discrimination. I think that health in Chile and in Latin America needs to change. It must be built listening to the country's needs. We need to have statistics and know what we have. Many countries don't know about how many people with rare disease there have. They don't know the costs in their country, the medicines that are needed. I think that this is the first step to know what we need so that we can address all the problems. And then what we have ahead of us are the treatments. But sometimes we can't even buy paracetamol to all the countries. So imagine the rest. Yes, I agree with you. And based on what Philippe said, I think that that's the case. I think that the most important thing after what we saw of the UN, we were expecting that to be the solution. We thought that we were going to have something wonderful in our hands. So we, we realized that that's not the case. What we could have was the law regarding the photo and how we did that. Gathering together with different groups, organizations, patients, fighting all together. As Philippe said, this is something that we achieved so far. We have few patients. We need to fight so that we can have more and more people involved and all together. Thank you, Fabio. And now I have a question so that we can wrap up the panel. We saw that there are many initiatives that can be developed around the world, but we need to articulate all the efforts so that the resolution and the framework that we have can reach more and more countries. So where do you think the bigger challenges. So you can you can answer this in a small sentence. What the main challenge is so that we can articulate the different frameworks both locally and globally and that these become a reality for many patients that are facing a complex situation. So Clara, you can start. Thank you. Well what Felipe Tapia said about this lack of information and figures of how many diseases and how many patients we have in different countries. Sometimes in different countries, they didn't even, they don't even know about the rare diseases. So this is one of the main challenges. And I really hope that something as the resolution can give us visibility that can be used on a national level. But well, this visibility is crucial. Thank you so much, Clara. Felipe? Yes, I think that one word that we have in Latin America and that has a great impact is corruption. I think that we should fight against that. In many cases, someone pays the government and they forget about the needs of patients. I think that this is a complex, complex issue and many times we have few research, research about this, about how they don't want to be involved with this topic, but we need to write about this and research about corruption because many countries are not facing the real needs of patients so they prefer to look to the other side thank you fabio i think that the main thing is what i said before is gathering organizations together patients organizations because I think 
that altogether, if they join the, their efforts, they can conquer a lot of things, and that should be the solution. So, as we are gathering together now with IAPO in Latin America, we are gathering together with Europe, and we are joining efforts. So, this is what we should do. We should be together and move forward, fight all together, so that we can have the state support that we need. Thank you, Fabio. You raised some really important issues, some things that are necessary to move forward and give support to the patients. So now in order to wrap up, first of all, I want to connect what you said about visibility, Clara. This is so important. So the resolution helps us in this because Rare diseases is included on the UN, and I know that this is not binding, but it's a political message. So, as you said, it's a pressure. So, I think that this is really important. And then, there are some other important issues that you raised. Of course, we have different realities in different countries, and we need to raise them. We need to work with the civil society. And we are always in this process. We are always articulating knowledges, creating situations, and we are the ones promoting changes in policies. And then what you said about taking care of the advances, of the advances that we have, the different laws, resolution, we should respect them and take care of them, and we should keep working, articulating, because we are not only dealing with patients, but different entities, health organizations, so that we can have an inclusion. And at the end of the day, this is going to help us with the SDGs. So, Clara, Fabio, Felipe, thank you all so much. And now, Stefania, I turn the floor over to you. It was an awesome session, so interesting, and policies are so important. This is about what we can do to improve people with rare diseases. We should be there, as we saw with the mobilization. We should be present. We need a change, so we need to be there to work on that. So now, we are going to have a small break. We'll be back at 3.35 p.m. Mexico time. We are going to talk about health of indigenous groups in Latin America. We don't talk about this a lot, but it's important to mention this. And remember that we have the photo booth. You can take pictures and share that on your social media. You can download your certificates, share the pictures with the hashtags LABC2022 and Congreso Pacientes Latam so that we can share this in our booth with everything that you are sharing. Remember that you can check out our exhibit hall. You can find IAPO and IAPO's members, people that are going to answer all your questions, and you can also learn about the work of IAPO's members through the videos that are going to be available during the break. See you back in some minutes. Stay tuned. We have more in our Congress.